Hello, hello, beautiful soul. So wonderful to connect with you as we dive into the cure for imposter syndrome. If you are new here, I am Dr. Andrea Pennington. I welcome you. I am an integrative physician with 22 years of treating many forms of trauma, substance use disorder, and eating disorders. And I really love this work because we can help people transform their lives. So even if you don't have anything super you know, dangerous or severe going on in your life, I think you're going to find this session very helpful. Part of the cure for imposter syndrome is about changing the narrative. The narrative is the story that you tell yourself about yourself. And we all have one. We all have a narrative that is going on in the back of our minds, right? So when we wanna talk about the cure for imposter syndrome, it really is all about embracing and embodying your authentic self. And lucky for you, <laughs> I have a step-by-step -step process that will guide you into that state, okay? So when we talk about changing the narrative, we're talking about changing the story that we tell ourselves. Now, oftentimes the stories that we tell, even if they are not true, they dictate our reality. Some of the stories are unconscious. They're not things that we literally say in our minds or say out loud, but maybe you can relate to that internal story of, I'm only worthy of love if I do X or if I achieve this. Or maybe you can relate to that internal story that I had for a long time, and that is, I'm not enough just as I am. Yeah? So the problem with unconscious stories is that they direct our behaviors, they can even direct our compulsions, and they feel correct. They feel like we just have to do them, even though the facts may not add up. In other words, when we question, like, why am I doing this? Why am I tweaking everything to perfection? Why am I walking around feeling like a fraud? Our logic will tell us this, this, this isn't right. And yet something about it still rings true. So I want you to imagine this. Imagine that we have a tiny little baby, a newborn, and we're going to ask a question. Is this little baby worthy of love? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Most of you are like, of course, right? Of course, this little baby is worthy of love. And did they have to perform for it? Did they have to do something? Did we take away the love because they cried or needed food or shelter? No. And so if this little baby is worthy of love, then why not you? So when we ask these questions, all of a sudden, it brings up all sorts of justifications and all sorts of reasons why, oh, no, no, I'm not worthy. Yeah. But the fact is, you work hard. You put in lots of effort with good intentions and you deserve praise. You deserve recognition. You deserve a break or rest. But then that's when the yabbits come right? Do you have any yeah buts? It's like we say, yeah, but then we point out everything that we didn't do well or everything that's left to do. Or worse yet, we compare ourselves to other people. Yeah, but I'm not as good as, yeah? And even though reason, our intellect tells us otherwise, we still beat ourselves down or we feel worthless or we engage in destructive behaviors of self-harm and self-deprecation. So we're gonna be talking about these yabbits. I call it the yabbit syndrome and we all have them, right? I remember being at an event and I was sharing a room with this beautiful woman from Norway and we were going to this like evening dinner and I was in the bathroom getting ready and I was singing. I had my little playlist going, trying to get all, you know, into a social mood. And when I came out, she was like, oh, your voice is so beautiful. 
and I just kind of froze and I could hear the yabbit. See, for a long time, I had a story that was, eh, I don't sing as well as, and for me, I used to compare myself to this very beautiful songstress. Her name was Maricel. She was the Latin queen of soul. And I found myself about to respond like, yeah, but, but because I've done this work, I stopped myself and I just said, thank you. Because to her, she wasn't comparing me to anyone else. She heard my voice and she loved it. Yeah? Okay, so we wanna get to the root of imposter syndrome. The source of those yeah buts, the source of our criticism is generally a part of us that's holding on to beliefs and stories from the past. And those parts of us are just trying to protect a more vulnerable part that may have been wounded or teased or bullied in the past. Now, even though some of these protective behaviors are actually to our detriment in the present and the foreseeable future, even though the intelligent, rational you of today, you might actually find it really hard to override these protective parts unless and until that part sees and believes a new truth. These protector parts need to believe a new story. And that's why we focus on changing the narrative through life writing narrative therapy, through psychedelic assisted therapy, meditation, hypnosis, and counseling. And that's what I do, I help people uproot these limiting beliefs and these self-defeating stories. And I have to tell you, this usually requires accessing material in the unconscious. And when we access it, we have to bring an open, curious, compassionate, heart-centered energy, not like an exterminator. <laughs> We're not trying to get in there and root things out and kick them out because that would be violent to our internal family system. And so we're, I'm going to share with you a process that I've outlined in the Real Self-Love Handbook that will help us. Um, and Julie says, I still have that story. I don't sing as well as my sisters. If anyone ever compliments my voice, I can't accept it. But I will change that this year. Wonderful, Julie. So I'm going to give you specific tips. And the first thing to do is just say thank you. That's it. And then shut your mouth. Because <laughs> a lot of us will say, oh, thanks, but, uh, and then we go into whatever. Just say thank you and close your mouth. And for a lot of us, it takes like so much control to do that and discipline, but over time it gets easier. And you're going to hear throughout this workshop that the more that we practice these behaviors, we can start to create new pathways in our brain, new neural networks that diverge from the old ways of being. This particular workshop came from some of the feedback that I heard for people who said that reciting affirmations didn't work for them. It just set up this conflict of like, I don't even believe these things. I'm saying it in my head, I'm listening to the meditation, and I don't believe it. And now you understand why. It's because there are parts of us locked in frozen in time in the unconscious that have different beliefs. So you as an adult today, you might wanna say something positive, but if it doesn't ring true to that other part, that's when that dissonance is set up. Now, one of the first ways that I realized that there was an ongoing story that I needed to change was in the early part of my life. So. I happened to be um, a young physician. I was running my own wellness center near Washington, DC. And I was also working for the Discovery Health Channel. So I was on TV every day, anchoring the news. I was also the host of several documentaries. And I had this big wellness center where people were being sent in from medical places and hospitals all around North America. So I had gotten to a pretty high level of success. 
I didn't feel a hundred percent comfortable. I kind of felt this constant need to do more. But the the moment that things started to shift for me was one afternoon when my father was in town visiting me. He was with me looking out at my garden in my home in Maryland. And in this garden, I happened to have bought a house that was so beautifully, meticulously decorated and designed by a couple. And one of the guys in this couple was actually working for the botanical gardens in Washington, DC. And he had designed a Japanese garden, an English garden. We had ponds, we had all these beautiful things. And my dad was looking out at my garden and I was standing there feeling very proud because it was so beautiful. And he started to pick and look at every little thing that could go wrong. Well, what about that pond? How do you keep it clean? What happens if the pump breaks? What about mosquitoes? And then he looked at the house. Oh my gosh, that, that tree is dropping leaves and pine needles. That's gonna you know, clog up your gutter. And, and he was just pointing out thing after thing after thing. And in my mind, I'm like, why is he doing this? And so I said, well, dad, the guy across the street, Al and his father, they have a landscape business and they've, they know this garden because they've been here for all the years. And he comes, he cleans the garden, he shovels the snow, he cleans out the gutters, he fixes the pump when they break, you know, everything works. And then as we're standing there, he says, why don't you just get a job at a hospital? And that just kind of blew my mind wide open because <laughs> I had achieved great success, was earning more money than anybody in my family ever had. I had even been on the Oprah show twice and published books. And that was when my mind opened and I realized that he lives in a different paradigm. For him, he grew up at a time where it was safer for you to get a job with a pension he wasn't an entrepreneur like me. He didn't understand the paradigm that I was living from. And it was literally in this moment that I realized I will never fulfill my dad's version of success. Even though I had everything that the American dream says you should aim for, the money, the car, the bank account, the, all of the things, and that was the, the first moment that I realized that there was a difference between what was going on in my head and how I'd been programmed. Are you getting this? Thank you for those of you saying that, yes, <laughs> you get it. You've had similar parents. Yes, these are parents that were well-meaning. My dad only wanted to keep me and my siblings safe. So of course, you know, these are, these are things that a parent might say to keep us safe but it wasn't in alignment with who I am. It wasn't in alignment with the world we're living in today. Right, so G says, I find it hard to shut up the cruel questioning voice, always looking for errors. It's so sad. Even the good things, even seeing the good things. Yes, well, we're going to get into that G. I have the solution for you, if you will just stick with me here. So that gives you a little background on how I realized there were these different stories and paradigms that we live under and how they dictate our behavior, how we show up in life, what we think is possible and what we are worthy of. So when we look at imposter syndrome, it's really defined as a feeling of fear, fear that someone's going to find out that you don't know enough that you're not smart enough, that you don't deserve whatever position it is that you have. It's that feeling like I'm an imposter, I'm a fraud, and I'm afraid someone's going to call me out on it. I had some of that as well. And you'll understand as I go on, where does imposter syndrome begin? For most of us, the origin is in our childhood. Either we were belittled, told that we didn't know what we were doing or told that we were dumb. Maybe we said something or tried to invent something and nobody believed in us. Or maybe it was because you were pressured to perform. That was the case in, in my family. I learned from a 
the age of being a toddler that you need to follow the rules, perform well in school, do what you're told in order to stay safe, to get affection and not punishment. And that is what drove me to have this compulsive need to prove myself. Now you may have compensated with a different behavior. It may be that you compensated from that in your childhood by turning on a perfectionistic trait. Now the challenge is, even if we have this compulsive need to achieve, like I did, or we become perfectionists and we get everything you know, shiny and nearly perfect, even though we may do a great job, internally, it never feels like it's enough, ever. And why is that? It's because if you performed well in that one area, based on your childhood, that wasn't enough. It's not like you got good grades and that was the end of it. And your parents said, okay, now we're just gonna treat you like you're smart. We're never gonna ask you about your grades ever again. No, there was always the next grade period or the next thing to achieve or the, the sports or whatever activities. And so we take on these behaviors that compensate to try to stay safe. Even though we escape childhood, we become adults. It's this compulsion that is driven by an unconscious part. Now, besides that fear that someone is gonna find out that you're a fraud, there could be other signs that you are living with imposter syndrome. So I want you to answer these questions. Question number one, do you find that you operate on a scale of zero or 100%? Meaning either something is absolutely perfect or it's crap. Answer that one correctly for yourself. You don't even have to tell us. You know if it's true. Question number two, are you able to acknowledge your success or your progress? Are you able to actually see when you've done something that's just good enough? Does good enough even exist in your vocabulary? Answer that question. And now question number three, when someone compliments you, do you find yourself playing the yeah, but game? Like, yeah, but it's not as good as so-and-so, or yeah, but I really could have done better. Another way that imposter syndrome often shows up in the narrative or the stories that we say is who me or who am I to? For me, while I was still working at Discovery Channel, I remember giving a keynote speech and right after I came back to Discovery and I was typing up the five keys to live heart healthy for a blog. <laughs> and there was somebody behind me and I could feel this presence. Turned out to be this woman named Rita and she was looking over my shoulder and she said, that's a book. And I'm like, what? No, these, these five steps, this is, this is my keynote speech that I just gave in DC. It's, you know, it's a blog. And she said, no, that's a book. And I was like, who would want to read a book by me? I mean, there's already, and I started to name all these famous authors, doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, blah, 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 blah. And she said, you know what? It's true. There are other authors out there. Maybe they have a similar message but they're not the same messenger. You have a different voice, you have a different delivery. And there are gonna be people who don't resonate with those other authors, but they will resonate with you. And that was also one of those mind expanding uh, opportunities for me to recognize that I had an automatic reflex of saying, ugh, who me? Ugh. And that can be another aspect of imposter syndrome. And yes, Esme says, I am able to acknowledge my success, but only for a moment. Then it's, now what? And we hear this so often with a lot of high achievers and athletes, like they train, they work hard to accomplish a big goal. And then it's like, uh, okay, now what? And that might be because you feel this compulsive need to achieve more. In other words, it's never 
enough. So why do we do it? How do we overcome it? From an internal family systems perspective, which was created by Richard Schwartz, from an IFS perspective, we could say that you have various parts of you that hold on to these beliefs and make those criticisms. So rather than saying, oh, I just doubt myself, mm, there's actually a part of me that doubts that I can be successful or as successful as somebody else. So for example, if you answered yes to question one, which was about that all or nothing approach to life, where it's either 100% or you failed, which is where I used to be. If you have that all or nothing approach, it leaves you almost always feeling like you're not enough. Getting an 80% on a test or 95 doesn't bring that little hit of dopamine, that excitement, that joy, that relief. And instead, it leaves you depleted in your energy and it lowers your morale. So that's a clue that there's a narrative that needs to be changed. Now, if you answered for question number two, that you find it hard to acknowledge your good qualities, your good work, your progress, then you might be overly tuned into looking at your flaws or your faults. And when you overlook your positive traits, your talents, the good outcomes, this also makes it really hard for you to rise up and take on greater roles. That feeds into that imposter mentality. And for question number three, if you find yourself saying, yeah, but mm, I didn't really quite get this right, or it isn't as good as, which happens a lot with artists that I know <laughs> and musicians. If you have that kind of yeah, but mentality, you are likely comparing yourself to someone or some ideal. And if that is the case, guess what? You're never going to match up because an ideal is just that. It's this fairy tale image and you cannot match it absolutely perfectly 100% of the time. It's impossible. And you can never be like anyone else, not 100%, even if you were an identical twin. <laughs> so it's impossible. So if we really want to cure ourselves of imposter syndrome, then I invite you to discover, accept, and love your authentic self. Self-acceptance is crucial when you want to put an end to comparison-itis, <laughs> all right? With self-acceptance, that's when you can reclaim your sovereignty, your power, and you can step into true accountability for your life, all right? So the first key in really changing the narrative of these parts of us that have been frozen in time, we can do that with meditation, we can do that with journaling, we can do that with psychedelic-assisted therapy, these things will help you end imposter syndrome and align with your authentic self. But I know some of you are thinking, but what if my old narrative is partly true? Like, how can I change that? The truth is every story can point to a new future. It is not locked in stone. So even if you did make mistakes and you're like, yeah, but I, yeah, I really have these problems over here. It doesn't mean that you have to continue down that path of always making the same mistakes, not being able to grow or evolve. That would be a sign of a fixed mindset. And we know that re research shows that when we have a growth mindset, we can change and we can evolve. The second key that I want you to recognize is by growing and evolving, by changing your narrative, even if you think that you're defective or broken, just know that you are a unique and precious being with a role to play that is not like anybody else on earth. Your past can actually teach you lessons and those lessons can be turned into blessings and inspire you with post-traumatic growth. And it all begins with reclaiming the narrative I, I had another live session where I talked about what are called absolutist 
words. And, you know, there was an interesting study done on self-talk and even the talk that people type into forums. When people use absolute words like always, never, totally, those sort of black and white thinking words, we know that there is a greater likelihood of having depression, even suicidality, and substance use. And so reclaiming the narrative means I can take the lessons from the past and I can start to create a new future, not the future that would have happened habitually if we kept going. So for me, I recognized that that turning point in my garden was a moment where I could choose. I can either keep trying to win the approval of my father and go down a, a particular path that for me would have led me to be very miserable, or I could start following my own heart and recognize I'm an adult, I get to choose now, right? And the third point for us to really focus on is expecting that your environment and your relationships are going to evolve with you. Now, often people will tell me that they're afraid that their friends or family are not gonna accept them because you're not being like you were before. They got used to you being in a certain role, or maybe they, can't be they won't believe that you can change. Well, the truth is, we are the ones that train people how to treat us. It may have started in childhood when you might not have, you might not have had conscious choice, but over time, if you continue to live out these roles and to accept being treated in a certain way, you're training people on how to treat you. And so retraining them or letting them go is going to happen over time and it happens with repetition. So everything that I'm describing here is something that we're gonna to have to do over and over. It's practice. That is how we create new pathways in the brain and in our nervous system. And so over time, you will attract or repel people who are or aren't aligned with you, with your values and with your personality, your true personality. And that's a good thing. You are meant to evolve. You're not meant to stay stuck. Does that make sense? Krishna asks, can you talk about insecurity, please? I have a friend who has everything, millions, money, high profile, but she's insecure at times. Why do, we, why do we feel insecure when we have everything? Well, Krishna, that's a great question. People who are celebrities, who have lots of money, have lots of success, fame, and things that should make them be secure are often the most insecure people because a lot of us are performers and we are driven to perform or achieve and succeed based on programs from the past rather than just being in alignment with what we really want. So, you know, we see, I, I worked in Hollywood for a long time, so I had kind of a lot of A-list celebrities and the people who truly felt like they were in alignment with their life's purpose as actors or performers, and they're doing it for the joy, they didn't feel as insecure as the people who came from dysfunctional or abusive families who were, you know, really good at something and they kept doing that so that they could keep getting the validation and the acceptance and the approval of others, but it never fed back into their authentic self of feeling good enough. And that's because there's a narrative in there that says, this isn't enough. I am not enough. The money is not enough. And that's why we're here today, to change that narrative. Why is it some people come from scarcity versus generosity? For most of us, it always dates back to the way we were socialized or conditioned as children. If you experienced scarcity in the home, that might have triggered the sense of scarcity. If you happen to have abundance and your parents taught you to share and there was always enough, then you might have more of an abundance mindset. And you know, for some people, it's not even rational. It, for example, We've ha I've had many clients and patients who said that their parents were alive during the Great Depression in the United States where they didn't have enough. And so they had to save, 
They, they bought, you know, canned food and stocked it up. And they always were planning for the next moment of depletion. And so their children and their grandchildren inherit, whether it's because they saw it or because part of our nervous system gets changed when we have grandparents that go through trauma or adversity, then the children and grandchildren have this tendency to have their immune system and their nervous system and their cardiovascular system tweaked. And so they may find that they're driven to make a lot of money, to acquire a lot of stuff, and yet it still feels like it's not enough. And so they hoard or they, they put everything in savings or they put plastic over the furniture so that nothing gets damaged. And all of that comes from the, the, the environments that, that we've experienced. And Jane says, abuse vis victims often live with a narrative created by an abuser or enablers hiding the truth. It's important to reclaim it. Absolutely, Jane. And that, that's what we're here to do today is reclaim the narrative. If we've been walking around with victim mentality, like life is happening to us, we've had all of these bad things, then if we claim that victim mentality, which nobody ever does it consciously, it's an unconscious program, then there's almost this continual expectation that bad things will continue to happen. We, could, we tend to say, oh, this always happens, or I'm always the, again, absolutist words. So what do we do if we have that victim mentality? Well, I'm gonna take you through the steps of the cornerstone process that are outlined in the Real Self Love Handbook so that you can overwrite those old programs. Yes, KD says, many of us were taught to survive and not to thrive. Absolutely. And for many of us, we have to say, thank God or thank our parents because fortunately we did survive. We made it through challenging experiences. We made it out of poverty or unsafe situations. But today, we're on the other side, and now we get to change. We get to change the narrative, and that means we get to dictate how we will live going forward, right? So let's get into it. What are the actual steps to take to begin changing the narrative? You can reprogram your unconscious beliefs just like I outlined in the Real Self Love Handbook. And here's a summary. The first thing we do is we identify a disturbing moment in time or an event. So typically I would invite you to listen to the safe space meditation that's in my teacher profile. That helps to calm down the nervous system, to really tune into the body and get present. Remember, I said that when we go in to the subconscious, we're not trying to go in like an exterminator, like I want to get out these beliefs and just kick them out. That would tend to ruffle our feathers of these protective parts because they're doing a job. They're doing a job that they believe is absolutely essential to your survival. So what we want to do is come with a calm, open-hearted, open-minded energy. And when we identify a moment in time or an event, we bring to mind a scene of when we were younger. And in this case, we want to identify when was a time that I was made to feel that I was not enough. Now, if you have experienced a great deal of trauma or abuse, I don't suggest that you go to the most traumatic memory, especially if that's going to cause a whole flood of symptoms and anxiety. We can choose a milder event and work from there just until you get the practice of doing this sort of work. So in my case, I could do the meditation and sort of bring to mind a time when I was younger and I felt like I wasn't good enough. And that was at a time when I did bring home a, a report card. It was mostly A's, couple of B's and a C. And I remember the reaction that I got. And so I could bring that scene to mind. 
and really tune into that younger version. And the first thing we do is ask. Ask that younger inner child to tell you what happened. Maybe you're visual and you can already see it, you already remember it. What we wanna do is we want to empower this child part to share. They may do it verbally, you might hear it, you might imagine it like a, a movie where this little child is saying, you know, dad is looking at me like I'm so bad and wrong because I didn't get all A's. It might come up when we get to the other step about journaling. But you basically want to ask this younger part to tell you what happened. What is it they, that they really wanted but didn't get? And so when I, when I meditate on this and I see myself and I see my dad's reaction, I can hear my inner child saying, I just wanted dad to tell me he was proud of me. Instead, I felt like I wasn't good enough. You can ask, what did your inner child need back then that they didn't get or what do they wish would have happened? What could have been done differently? Now, the most important thing to ask that inner child is what are the beliefs that you're holding based on what happened? Beliefs about yourself, beliefs about your, your parents, or beliefs about the world. Oftentimes, we might take on the belief that it's not safe. It's not safe to speak up. It's not safe to be seen. It's not safe to take up space. We may have taken on the belief that I need to stay small, I need to hide, I need to be quiet. Or in my case, I need to work harder, I need to be perfect, I need to get everything right. Those were the beliefs that my inner child took on. What if you blocked out a lot of your childhood as a self-defense technique? And now, 20 years later, I cannot remember any of those earlier years. I also have no contact with those individuals for 20 years, so I can't recall details. That is totally fine. You don't need to have a specific or the origin event. The very first time it happened, it's nice when we can, but for some of us, this stuff started in other lifetimes. So instead, what we want to do is just bring to mind a younger version of you that was dealing with the consequences of these beliefs that you know are holding you back. So if you have these beliefs that I've got to get things absolutely perfect or it's crap, or you have this belief that, oh, I can't celebrate my success because mm, you can even just, if you can't go to childhood, then just go to five years ago. It's totally fine. All we want to do is identify the part that's holding the belief. So it doesn't necessarily matter if we don't go to the exact moment. And for many of us, we took on beliefs in the form of messages before we even had words. So even as a baby, you might have taken on beliefs. Now you don't think of it in the same way, but a baby that was left in the crib crying, you know, back in the olden days when Silly doctors said, oh, just let the baby cry it out, or in-laws. Oh, don't, don't pick up the baby too much. You'll spoil the baby. Let him cry it out. Well, a baby who doesn't necessarily have words and certainly doesn't have reason will just recognize my crying doesn't matter. And later that gets translated into I don't matter. So it doesn't matter if you can remember a specific event or not. You can go back to just two years ago, maybe at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, you had an issue come up. You can go back to that moment, right? Great. So that's what we do. We imagine this event when we're taking on, we're feeling this, this energy, this shame, this guilt, this fear, whatever it is. And we ask that younger version to just tell us what happened. What did you need that you didn't get? What do you wish that you could have done differently or would have happened differently? And what are the beliefs that you've taken on as a result of that event? The beliefs about yourself, 
the beliefs about the world or the beliefs about authority figures. And if you can, just offer that younger part of you compassion, tender words of compassion. If we do this in the guided meditation, it's on my teacher profile, you'll, you'll hear in the guided meditation of how you can do this, but you can do it in your imagination. You can literally do the two chair technique from Gestalt therapy. And you could imagine your younger self sitting in the chair and you can just say all of the words that you would want them to hear. I am so sorry that that happened to you. I'm so sorry that dad did that. I'm so sorry that you've been carrying these burdens for this long time. You could even imagine while you're in that meditative state, because this inner child or younger version has told you what they wish would have happened, you could even imagine a scenario where things were repaired or they were protected. Now, in my attunement meditation process, I invite you to call in a compassion figure. Um, so it could be yourself or it could be another being that offers compassion. The next thing we do is we call forth. Now, you may just want to just do that and then take a break. But if you're up for it, you could then call forth the part of you that compensates or manages your life with certain behavior or criticism. So what I mean is there is a part of you, I'll give myself as an example. There was a part of me that became a perfectionist. That perfectionist part would manage everything, would tweak all of my documents, would always be, you know, making sure everything was written the way it should be and da da da. So in that meditative state, I can call forth my perfectionist part and also ask this part, tell me, why do you do that? Again, we're not trying to criticize. We're not trying to blame them. We just want to hear, why do you do that? And it might be very obvious. They're going to be like, well, <laughs> duh, because if we don't get things right, we can be rejected. They may not say this clearly, but it's generally about fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of criticism, or free, fear of being hurt, fear of losing something. And then if you can, if you have that, that good self energy, as we call it, if your heart is open and you can say, wow, I get why you do that. Acknowledge why they do what they do. In the words of Richard Schwartz, there are no bad parts. All of our parts have good intentions. You may choose to update that part on the consequences of the actions. Like, you know what? Your perfectionism, I get why you're doing it, but it's preventing me from like releasing this podcast or writing my book or asking for a job. Without blaming, no accusatory tone, just letting that part know. The next step is where we move into providing proof of competency. We wanna to prove to that inner child, to these other parts, that we're really competent. We can do this. And we make a list of new beliefs. So this is where we, we, uh, we look at what are the things that you've actually gotten right? Because oftentimes, as I said, these parts, they don't, they don't congratulate you and say, okay, now we can rest. They're like, okay, now what do we do next? So what they, these parts often don't recognize is all of the years that we've done things well. They're just always with their blinders on looking for what's the next threat, what's the next thing to accomplish. And so this is something that takes practice to congratulate yourself, to acknowledge yourself, and to, to show proof that, you know what, I, I really am... Um, better than, than you think I am. And making a list of new beliefs. We provide proof of our competency. We make a list of our new beliefs that are in opposition to the negative beliefs. And then the third thing that we have to do is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Because you didn't become a negative Nelly or end up with imposter syndrome with just one overnight situation. 
These things have been reinforced time and time again. And so that's what is going to have to happen. We have to reinforce, practice, and rewrite our source code. So again, I mentioned that in my teacher profile on Insight Timer, you'll see that there is a safe space guided meditation. I generally invite people to start with that. It teaches you how to regulate your nervous system and how to drop in to the subconscious because that's where a lot of these parts are hanging out. And then the practice can also involve journaling. So these parts often don't really get a whole lot of attention. They're back there. And if you're like me, sometimes you just tell them to shut up, like, just leave me alone, just like, go away. But when we're asking these questions, it's great to have a journal to write down what comes up. What does your inner child want you to know? What does your perfectionist want you to know? Um, if you're finding that it's hard to either imagine in the guided meditation, nothing's coming up, then you can do what we call non-dominant handwriting. So your dominant hand is the hand that you normally write with. So if you're right-handed, you might literally do the safe space meditation, take out your pen and pencil after, and then write, dear me at age 15, what do you want me to know? You write that in your dominant hand, take the pen or pencil to the other non-dominant hand and write out the response. At first, it's gonna feel like, is this just me? I mean, I don't know. How do I know if this is really my inner child? It doesn't matter. You will be accessing material in the unconscious and through your non-dominant hand, you can start to journal and see what comes up for you. You'll also see the attunement process. It's an inner child meditation. And the more that you do that, you will start to create a relationship with all these various parts so that they can feel safe to come out. If you've been beaten down by an inner critic, like I had for a lot of time, there may be a lot of resistance that comes up. And that's why I say, we're not trying to go in and exterminate anyone. We're not trying to change things until and unless these parts fully agree. So for many of us, we can get into a meditative state and we can see a scene where a younger part of us comes forward. We might, I don't want you to relive trauma, but you might see something troubling. You might actually wanna scoop up that younger version of you and take it somewhere safe. That's why we do the safe space meditation. Take them out of the scene and then just ask that inner child or that younger version, tell me what happened. What happened to you? What is, what is it you want me to know? What do you wish would have happened differently? What did you want that you never got? So we can ask those questions as we're in the meditation and you might even see that younger part of you start to say it. You could yourself sit in another chair and assume the position of that younger version and just say it out loud, or you can write it. So the way we do the, the journaling is with your dominant hand, so I am left-handed, with my left hand, I would say, okay, five-year-old Andrea, tell me, tell me what you want me to know about that, that situation where dad was really mean to you about your spelling words. I might sit there, tune in, and then pick up the pen with my non-dominant hand and write. And yes, it's gonna be scribbly and scratchy because it's, unless you're ambidextrous, it's not the hand you always write with. And that's okay. This is a way to access the subconscious. And that's where these parts of us live. So guest says, aha, instead of trying to shut up my judge or inner critic or manager, I can reset her to actually support and motivate the way I need her to. Absolutely. That's one of the cool benefits. The more you work with IFS or internal family systems, the more that you can create a relationship with these parts. And because they're very motivated to help you, to protect you, to you know, keep you safe or help you succeed, you can start to give them other roles. So yeah, eventually the inner critic 
could become an inner cheerleader, or you could just retire the inner critic when they're ready and nurture an inner cheerleader or nurture your inner loving parent. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking with me for this hour. I hope that this has been helpful to give you a new way to look at accessing what is in your unconscious, tuning into these various parts of you to really cure imposter syndrome by healing these wounded parts, giving your critical parts new jobs, but ultimately just getting to, to know your whole system. When we can bring more awareness and love and compassion for ourselves, we can change the narrative. We can take these painful experiences of the past and rewrite our narrative about who we are, what we deserve, and what we're going after in this life. Thank you so much for being here. I wish you many blessings for the rest of your week, and I'll see you next time. Take good care, everyone. Much love.